Well, tonight the title of my message is Payday is Coming. Because whatever we sow, we will ultimately reap. If we remain in that baby stage of Christianity, always just doing what we want, what we think, and what we feel, we will reap that. And we really won't like what we reap, and we'll probably blame the devil, and we'll probably blame people. But the truth is, we just never got around to doing what we should have been doing to start with. Can somebody say amen? amen? How many of you know we love to blame all of our problems on somebody else? If we can't find a person, then it's the devil's fault. Yeah. <laughs> However, the truth of the matter is, is nobody else is in charge of your happiness except you. Do unto others. We read this stuff too fast, and we go on to something else, and we just don't get it. What kind of power is this given us in our lives? Do you want people to appreciate you? Then start appreciating everybody you meet. Do you want people to compliment you? Then start sowing compliments everywhere you go. When people give you a gift, do you want them to give you a really nice gift, something you'd really like to have? Then start giving nice gifts. Don't buy the cheapest thing you can find. Give people good stuff. Now, a little more understanding on a couple of scriptures that we probably are well aware of. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and spacious and broad is the way that leads away to destruction. And many are those who are entering through that gate. A wide gate, a broad path, not hard to be on. You can live by your feelings and be on that path. You can do what you think and be on that path. You can have a bad attitude and be on that path, but it's going to lead to destruction. But the gate is narrow, contracted by pressure. And the way is straight and compressed that leads away to life. And few are those who find it. The Bible says many are called, few are chosen. Many are called, but few are willing to take the responsibility to rise up and be the men and women of God that God wants them to be. We can't wait to feel like doing what's right to do what's right. We do what's right because it's right. We can't live according to the way we think and what we want. We're always telling everybody what we think. I think, I think, well, I think, well, I think. This talks about the broad path and the narrow path. So few people ever make it all the way through the wilderness and live in the promised land. So few. And I'm giving my life to try to encourage more people to grow up. I love to see people get saved. And we have hundreds of thousands of people receive Christ in our meetings. But I frankly don't think that's enough. I want to see you go to heaven, but that's not all I want to see. I want to see you have a good life while you're here. I want to see every one of us become a fruit-bearing Christian. I want to see every one of us affect other people's lives and take other people to heaven with us. I don't want to just go myself. I want to take a crowd. And that doesn't happen because we've got a bumper sticker and a rhinestone Jesus pin and a cross hanging around our neck. We got to have fruit, 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 fruit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the narrow path, the broad path. Now let's put these three scriptures together and I think we get a little more understanding. Whatever you want other people to do for you, do that for them. Enter through the narrow gate. That is the narrow gate. On the narrow path, there's no room for our fleshly baggage. On the narrow path, we can't do what we want, what think, what we think, and what we feel. We can't just talk to anybody any way we want to talk to them. You can do that on the broad path, but that'll lead to destruction. However, on the narrow path, you're going to have to treat people the way you want to be treated. On the broad path, you wait for somebody to do something right for you, and then maybe if you feel like it, you'll do something right for them. But on the narrow path, that don't work. That's what the narrow path is. You want to know what the narrow path is? You got to get rid of all that fleshly baggage and start really living for God's will. In God's economy, you give first and then you receive. 
We always want to receive first and then see if there's any of it that we don't want that maybe we could part with. But that's not the way it works with God. Now let's talk about Jacob for a minute because I think his story is great. Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau was born first, so he was the oldest. And under the Old Testament Jewish way of doing things, the firstborn son always got a double portion of the inheritance. It was called the rights of the firstborn. When the father died, he would, before he died, he would pray that special blessing prayer over the firstborn son. And they just always had a greater portion of everything. Well, Jacob and Esau's father, Isaac, knew that it was time for him to die. So he called the older son Esau. And he said, I know my time here is just about up. And I want to pray the blessing prayer over you. We want to celebrate with a meal. So Esau was a hunter. And he said, I want you to go out into the field and kill an animal and make a special stew. And then I want you to come and we're going to celebrate. And I'm going to pray this prayer over you. It was a big thing. A big, 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 big thing for them. Well, Jacob and Esau's mother actually favored Jacob, the younger of the twins, and she wanted him to have the blessing, but the only way he could get it would be if they tricked Isaac. So she quick made the stew before Esau could get back with the animal he went to hunt. And she talked her son into pretending to be Esau. And one of the things he did was he had to put the skin of a hairy animal on him because Esau was a, a hairy man and Jacob was a smooth-skinned man. So he went in and pretended to be the older son, Esau, and received the prayer of blessing. Now the thing that's very interesting to me is even after... Isaac realized what he'd done. He couldn't take it back. That's how powerful that prayer was. Once he'd given it, he said, what I've blessed is blessed, and I can't take it back. Amazing. Well, of course, then there was problems between Esau and Jacob. So Jacob spent a good number of years running and hiding. You know, when you do the wrong thing, you always got to hide. He got what he thought he wanted by fleshly ways rather than waiting on God to bless him. And all it did was create fear and misery in his life. So after a while, he ran into his uncle, Laban, and wanted to go to work for him. And Laban had a daughter that he really liked. Her name was Rebecca, and he wanted to marry Rebecca. And Laban said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll let you marry Rebecca, but you got to work for me seven years first. So for seven years, he labored and worked for Rebecca. When the seven years were up and it was time for the wedding, Laban got him drunk. And he woke up in his tent the next morning. And he looked over at the woman he'd slept with and married. And it wasn't Rebecca. It was her sister, Leah. Well, he was heartbroken. He'd been tricked. He'd been deceived. How could you do that to me? Come on now. After seven years of working for you, now you've lied to me, you've tricked me, you've deceived me. I think he totally forgot what he did to Esau. I wonder how many times we're all bothered about something that we've done. I mean, about something that somebody's doing to us. And we've totally forgot that we did the same thing to somebody else and didn't see it as a problem at all. Later on in his life, the same thing happened. His own sons deceived him concerning Joseph who was his favorite and youngest son. They were jealous of Joseph. And they took him out into a field and to hunt with him, and they ended up selling him to slave traders. They went back and told Jacob, his father, that he'd been killed by wild animals, and once again, he was deceived and tricked. 
you know, God forgave him. He came to a point in his life where he wanted things straightened out between him and Esau, and Esau forgave him, and God forgave him. But he still had something working in his life, because sometimes when you put it on the wheel, it's going to keep coming back around. Now, let me explain this, because I know that we all know that God is merciful. But here's what I want to tell you, and I thought about this a long time, because I don't ever want anybody to think that every time you do something wrong, you're going to get banged over the head. We know that God is merciful. But here's what I want to tell you, and I want you to just... Listen to this. Paul said that he received grace because he acted in ignorance. It's one thing to be ignorant and not know any better. better. It's another thing to sit in church week after week after week after week after week. Have your whole Bible underlined. Watch Joyce Meyer on television three times a day. Watch five or six other Christian programs. Hear all the great worship, have all the DVDs, all the CDs, have your car with bumper stickers telling everybody you're a Christian. It's one thing to be totally ignorant and do that kind of stuff. Then you come to a knowledge of God, you repent, and there's mercy. And there's still mercy for us, even now. But we have a much greater responsibility. And I can tell you something. I don't believe that God in his mercy can deliver us from every circumstance that we create by bad behavior. Because if he does, then we never learn and we never change and we never do things any different. You see, you get quiet when somebody preaches to you like this because we'd rather think we can do whatever we want to and just get by with it. I didn't say God wouldn't love you. I didn't say you wouldn't go to heaven. But I said there is a law that works in the earth of sowing and reaping. And if you didn't know anything about it before you walked in here tonight, you're going to know about it when you leave. And that's going to give you a greater responsibility to realize the next time that you criticize somebody and go gossip about them to five or six other people. I mean, it's time for us to grow up. What sense does it make to just keep hearing the same messages over and over and over and over again and sit out there and say, amen, amen, praise the Lord. Ooh, that was good. <laughs> Hallelujah. I think I'll buy that DVD. <laughs> and then the next time there's a test, how many messages have you heard on forgiving your enemies and praying for those that hurt you? 100, 200, 300? But I could have taught tonight on bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and I would have had 80% of the people in this room tonight tell me that they needed prayer in that area. Sometimes you don't need any more prayer. <laughs> what you need is to grab yourself by the back of the neck, give yourself a good shaking, and say, now I've heard everything I need to hear. Now it's time for me to do what God is telling me to do, <laughs> whether I feel like it or not. You don't have to feel like talking to somebody to talk to them. I mean, even right now, if Dave would make me mad, I would go home and I would not want to talk to him. But you know what I've learned? I'll do it on purpose. Because I'm not giving the devil any more foothold, any more ground in my life. You don't have to feel like praying for somebody to pray. You don't have to feel like talking to them to talk to them. You don't have to feel like being good to them. You don't have to feel like giving your tithe and offering. You don't have to feel like going to church. You don't have to feel like anything. You say, God, help me. Strengthen me in the inner man so I can go out and do what you're asking me to do instead of just doing what I feel like doing. Now you're sowing a seed that's going to bring a great, wonderful harvest and payday in your life. Can somebody shout and say amen? Now just to make sure you understand what I'm saying, I'm not saying that God doesn't give us mercy. I'll tell you what, if God didn't give us mercy, we'd all be dead. But I do believe that when we've been in the Word five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and we're still going around and around and around the same mountains then it's time for something to change. Can anybody say, I agree, amen. amen. How many of you know better than to gossip? 
How many still do it? All the people that know not to. How many know better than to tell everybody secrets? The Bible says don't tell, her, don't tell people secrets. And yet we just can't hardly stand up. Well, I'm just going to tell you and just don't tell anybody. <laughs> and then we even get spiritual about it. And you know, I'm just going to tell you so you can pray. No, you ain't telling them so they can pray. You're telling them because you just can't stand not to tell something. I mean, it's bad enough to do it. It's doubly bad to spiritualize it. And I know because I've done it. I mean, everything I teach you, you should have no problem eating it because it's coming off my own plate. I've had to eat it first. I'm not preaching out of theory. I'm preaching out of my life. Hallelujah. I would never tell you something that I didn't feel like God had told me first. God loves you so much. My goodness, we just have no idea the life that God has planned for us. I mean, I was thinking tonight, we don't even really grasp God is good. And God has a good plan. I don't imagine there's anybody that's ever lived that's even tapped into 10, 15, 20% of God's good plan. And I think this thing that I'm sharing tonight is very important. I feel like that this is really something that we need to grab a hold of. You can radically change what's going on in your life if you'll just begin to do unto others as you want them to do unto you. I said you can radically change what's happening in your life. You talk about people the way you want to be talked about. You think about people the way you want them to think about you. You treat them the way you want people to treat you. And you be committed to doing it from now until the time Jesus comes back to get you. And you're going to be amazed at what God's going to do for you. And you know what? You may treat this person over here right, and maybe they'll never get it, and they'll never treat you right, but God will still bring you a reward through somebody else over here somewhere. That's why I tell people, if you didn't get the promotion at work that you deserved, and somebody got it, they don't even work nearly as hard as you. You still have a good attitude. You be happy for them. You keep doing a good job. And even if that boss never changes and sees your value, God will either get him out of there and get somebody in that will, or he'll get you out of there and give you a better job somewhere else. But if you don't get treated right, and then you act bad about it, get a bad attitude, gossip, at the lunch table, I hate this place. Well, you just will stay there. Complain and remain. Praise and be raised. Come on, I'm doing better than you're acting. Complain and remain. My, my, my. I feel better tonight than I ought to. I don't know what's wrong with me. Galatians 6. You know, I like this because I feel like this puts power in my hands. I feel like, man, this has given me some authority. This has given me some power. I can change some things in my life if I'll just begin to give away what I want. That's really what that means. Give away what you want. Wow. Wow, wow, and double wow. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Give away what you want. Do not be deceived and deluded and misled, verse 7. God will not allow himself to be sneered at, scorned, disdained, or mocked by mere pretensions or professions, or by his precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes himself who attempts to delude God. For whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. He who sows to his flesh, lower nature, sensuality, will from the flesh reap decay and ruin and destruction. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint and acting nobly and doing right. For in due time. <laughs> and at the appointed season, we shall reap. 
if we do not faint, relax our courage, quit, and give up. I may not get my reward from the person I'd like to get it from, but God will get it to me one way or the other. If it don't come in the front door, it'll come in the back door. And if it can't come through a window, it'll come down the chimney. Those that come to God must believe that He is. And that He is the rewarder. The rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Everything in our life is a seed. Every attitude, every action, every thought, all of our words, every prayer. The Word of God is called seed that's planted in our heart. When it's watered and nourished, it grows up and becomes fruit-bearing trees of righteousness. The money that we give is called seed. We take that seed and we plant it in the ground of God's kingdom. And it brings a harvest in our own life. The Bible says if you judge others, you'll be judged. But if you sow mercy, you'll reap mercy. I could preach a whole sermon here tonight on just being merciful to people. Giving people the freedom to be themselves. Don't try to make them be what you want them to be. Train up a child in the way they should go according to their own individual bent, gift, or personality. As parents, we're supposed to find out what God wants to do with this kid and help them be what God wants them to be. Not try to make them be what we want to be and try to make them fulfill all of our unfulfilled dreams. Come on. <laughs> Some of you are still hurting right now because your parents didn't know how to let you be who you were. Some of you felt strange and unusual all your life because you didn't seem to fit in to what everybody else thought the mold was. We need to learn how to give people freedom if we want freedom. We need to learn how to stop pressuring people to be perfect. Hello? I like people to give me a little space. You know, maybe my message tonight won't even be perfect, but I hope you love me enough to like it and come back anyway. Don't send me letters about what you didn't like. Just in case you didn't hear me, don't send me letters about what you didn't like. I don't want to hear it. I want to be encouraged. I don't want to be discouraged. You have to be good to older people. Hallelujah. I'm going to play this thing up, boy. I love this Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Oh, my gosh. Sometimes you got to do the right thing with tears running down your face. It's so hard you feel like it's just going to absolutely kill you. You know, there have been times when David's hurt my feelings or made me mad, and honestly, I felt like the devil concreted my mouth shut. It was just like I could not go in the other room and speak to him if my life depended on it. <laughs> it's not always easy to do what's right. Sometimes you've got to do it through gritted teeth and tears. <laughs> 